What do Gloria Diaz, Margarita Moran, and Pia Wurzbach, and Catriona Gray have in common? What's Miss Universe? They are Filipinas who have won Miss Universe, correct? Did you know that the Philippines is number four in terms of the number of Miss Universes? Number four. You know who number one is? With the most, which country is number one with the most number of Miss Universes? Venezuela is number two. Who's number one? Huh? Puerto Rico is number three. Who's number one? USA. Of course it's the USA. Why? Some research I did last night. Well, we are indeed uh, in a place where this is, where appearance matters anywhere in the world. Hollywood, Los Angeles. In fact, I have heard some rumors somewhere that there is a certain Bible study group at CICC where celebrities attend. I mean, their names are celebrities, I heard. Now, you can ask some people, you know what I mean. They know each other by the, yes, the names of celebrities. That's how they somehow have given these names so that they enjoy their fellowship together. When you think about celebrity, when you think about appearance, when you think about first impressions, you know, I think it's important for us to place all of that in the light of scriptures. Because if the Christian life were a beauty pageant, we would all be in trouble. Certainly miserable if the Christian life were a beauty pageant. Thank God that the Christian life is not about how we look. Appearances matter. How we look matter. But as far as God is concerned, it is secondary. The main thing is the heart. You see, appearances have a way of hiding the heart, isn't it? And if God is all about the heart, then appearances can be damaging if we don't take care of our hearts. When appearances become the main thing, we are in trouble. Because when we live our lives from the outer shell, we miss out on God's transforming work in our heart. And so a hang-up, an obsession with appearance, will cloud and will eventually replace the centrality of Jesus Christ in our hearts. And therefore, we must be extra careful when it comes to appearance. Now, I'm not saying don't look good. It's important to look good, of course. But it is not the main thing. And we need to know the difference. This morning we're going to look at two chapters in 1 Samuel. They're both very familiar, chapter 16 and chapter 17. And may I say that the, the word that brings these two chapters together is appearance. It's the word appearance. It's the word for impression. It's the word for the outward shell. And that appearance actually has an impact on our relationship in our knowledge, in our pursuit of God. If we don't, if we aren't careful about this outer shell, it can actually affect our hearts. So, how do I maintain a connectedness with God that is daily and that is consistent? How can I have a heart truly after God's heart? And so today, again, we're looking at David, a man after God's heart, as it says in Acts 13. But today, it's all about appearances and appearances. So let's begin 1 Samuel chapter 16. The first point I want to make is this. God is wise, and He shows His wisdom in the way He chooses people that He will favor and use in this life. Now, we learn certain lessons here in chapter 16. The first lesson is this. We are easily wowed by first impressions, aren't we? We like to be entertained. We love to be somehow overwhelmed by wow, by impact, right? So here we find 1 Corinthians, 1 Samuel 16. You remember the story? Saul, King Saul, had now been rejected by God. 
His dynasty will not last. His dynasty will end with him. Now when we enter the scene of chapter 16, Samuel the prophet is crying. Samuel is in tears. He's grieving over the fact that Saul has lost it. Saul is no longer going to be the king. He's going to be replaced. And Samuel is grieving that fact. Now, you might have wondered, why would Samuel grieve over Saul? When in reality, it was Samuel who rebuked Saul so many times concerning his failure to obey what God had clearly commanded, isn't it? But now, he's grieving. Why? Well, may I suggest, Samuel the prophet too was fascinated by Saul's looks. Why do I say that? You see, Saul was an incredibly dashing man. He was handsome. He stood head and shoulders above everyone else. And so if you look at chapter 9, verse 2, it actually says this in the New Living Translation. Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. Well, he was a quiet fellow. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Nobody knew him. But when he came out in public after hiding in the baggage before he was proclaimed as king, when he came out, everybody said, Oh my goodness! OMG! Yes! Yes! That is surely the Lord's anointed. Even Samuel was taken in. Remember what Samuel said when he crowned Saul at that time, the people's king. 1024 goes like this. Take a good look at whom God has chosen the best. No one like him in the whole country. And guess what? Samuel doesn't even know Saul. And yet, he already says, Look at this guy. This must be the guy. Truly, God has chosen. God must be that wise to choose this guy. Wow. Everybody got wowed. So Samuel loved Saul, in a way. He saw all the potential in this most handsome of a man, but gone bust. Just like that. And so now he's grieving. Saul's bright future laid in the dark coffin of misery. The coffin of oblivion. He'll be forgotten. And God says to Samuel while he's grieving, Stop it. Stop it, Samuel. Stop crying. Stand up. Go to Jesse in Bethlehem because my chosen king awaits. So you see, Samuel scared to search a new king this time. You see, not only is he fascinated by appearances, Samuel was also frightened by appearances. He got frightened. He's afraid of what King Saul will do once he hears he's out looking for his successor. I mean, wouldn't you? And so he says, God, are you serious? He's going to kill me. I mean, those are the words, basically, that I paraphrase. Are you serious? He's going to kill me if he finds out I'm looking for his substitute. You know, appearance fascinates, but it also frightens. You see, with that in mind, God would enroll Samuel in a course called Real Beauty 101. Real Beauty 101. Look at verse 6 of 1 Samuel. It goes like this. So then it came about when they entered that Samuel looked at Eliab and thought, Surely, the Lord's anointed is before him. The same word. First time to see this guy, and he says, Surely, the Lord's anointed is before him. You know, I love this guy Samuel, because I see myself a lot in him. There was no doubt in his mind, Eliab was a winner. God's choice was so excellent. And like Samuel, you know, we're not only fascinated, frightened by appearance, but we get so fixated by appearance, almost obsessed by appearance, that all that matters is the first impression. Now may I say, a fixation with appearance glorifies first impressions. The Lord said to Samuel, verse 7, 
But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. Harsh words. God rejects this kind of a measurement. God rejects this kind of a standard. God rejects this template of who gets his favor. He rejects the criterion of image only, primarily. That is rejected in the sight of God. And so here's lesson number one. He says this, he continues on, For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. And we need to keep reminding ourselves over and over and over again, it's always and only about the heart. So we continue on with the story. Here's the second lesson. You see, God is won by the hidden person. If you want to impress God, it's not through the outward shell. It's not through what people can see. It's not from what people can hear. You want to impress God? It's all here, hidden. It's all hidden. What impresses him is what he can only see. And not what others can. That's the most impressive to God. After seven sons of Jesse, remember, wrap up the fashion show, fail to meet God's criterion, Samuel asks, are these all the children? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is tending the sheep. Now, this is very important. Somebody, there's, a, there's an eighth son, He's not even named. Jesse doesn't even say, oh, we have another son. His name is David. He simply says this, oh, there remains another one, but he's not a part of this fashion show. He's out there tending the sheep. He's the youngest. When you go to chapter 17, you'll see that phrase again, David, the youngest, when he fights Goliath. But here, he's simply described as the youngest and that he is tending the sheep. You see, the youngest meant the lowest in the pecking order, especially in a culture where, remember this word, primogeniture. Have you heard that word before? Primogeniture, the right of the firstborn son. You remember that one? He, he has the right to the inheritance. Firstborn son. That's why the firstborn was critical in Israel. Now David was the youngest. He's the eighth son. And so there's no need to mention his name. I mean, he's not even included in the show. He's out there tending the sheep. You don't need to name him. The youngest, the lowest, the pecking order. At a place and time where the right of the firstborn was a cultural value, David is ignored, yes, excluded in the show. You see, his insignificance in the eyes of men it shows in his obscurity. He's out there in the field tending the sheep. It shows in what he does. He's with the lowest and the smelliest. He's not with the high and mighty. He's with the lowest and the smelliest of all the sheep. In verse 12 it says this, So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, it says. Beautiful eyes, handsome appearance. Now we just thought, all appearances are no good. But David was handsome. He was nice looking. But you see, it's not the appearance. He just says he was nice looking, but you see, God still looks at the heart. So we're not disqualifying looks at all. Not disqualifying appearances. But it's not appearance that God looks at. He looks at the heart. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. The insignificant. The invisible, the forgotten, God chooses. Appearance doesn't play in God's criteria of choice. But unlike us, you know, God isn't wowed. He isn't impressed at all with appearance. However, God doesn't 
automatically disqualify on the basis of appearance. It's all a matter of the heart, whether good or not so good appearance. Does that make sense? Can anybody say amen? amen. The Apostle Peter echoes the same lesson. In chapter 3 of 1 Peter, verse 3 and 4, he says this. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty that depends on jewelry or beautiful clothes or hair arrangement. Be beautiful inside. In your hearts or the hidden person of the heart with the lasting charm of a gentle and quiet spirit that is so precious to God. Be beautiful inside, much more important than anything else. You might have heard of this, uh, uh, um, it's not a story, but, but it's, a, it's a, an anecdote. It's fiction, of course. But there's this letter to Jesus, the son of Joseph. And the letter is from Jordan Management Consultants. And it goes like this. Dear Sir, Jesus that is, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have selected for managerial positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests, have arranged personal interviews with our psychologist and executive aptitude consultant. It is our opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. For example, Simon Peter, emotionally unstable, given to fits of temper. Andrew, absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they place personal interest above company loyalty. And Thomas, he demonstrates a questioning attitude that would undermine morale. Matthew, you know the tax collector? He's blacklisted by the Jerusalem Better Business Bureau for corruption. And James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, they have radical leftist leanings. And they both registered high in the manic depressive scale. Of course, there's one candidate that shows great potential, it says, a man of ability, resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, he's ambitious, he's responsible, and therefore we recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. It's just different, isn't it? When you talk about the kingdom of God, when you talk about the church, when you talk about the outside world, it is so different. Man looks at the outward shell, but God looks at the heart. God's wisdom in choosing. The second lesson is this that we find. We're now in chapter 17. God's weapon in fighting. You know, before I get in there, it's been my observation that in God's economy, in, in God's style of doing ministry, good Christian leaders are those who don't want to be. Good Christian leaders don't even aspire to be. Good Christian leaders are reluctant to become leaders. And yet they are forced into positions of leadership under the inward pressure of the Holy Spirit in their hearts and the press of the external situation that's how A.W. Tozer puts it the press that is the context of what life is in the church for example the press of the external situation these are the ones that push people to become God's leaders. They are moved to accomplish what only He can accomplish and who alone will receive the glory. David, least likely leader. Least likely leader. And yet God sought him, used him as an ordinary person, but whose inner heart was right 
before him. Now we move to chapter 17. We find what is God's weapon in fighting. 17 and 16, they're linked together by this reference, the youngest. You'll find in verse 14 of chapter 17, David again is described as the youngest. In other words, the least likely leader is also the least likely warrior. You know, think about this. The least likely leader, David, the king, who's going to be king, is also the least likely warrior. He's not even part of the Israelite army. You remember? Anyway, we'll get to the story. We move the scene to the Valley of Elah in Israel. And if you join the tour in May, we're going to bring you to that valley. Another Philistine battle is happening in the Valley of Elah. But unlike any other previous skirmishes with the Philistines, the mode of this war is of a championship. You know, there's a difference. There is a war where everybody fights one another, but this kind of a war, it becomes by championship. The Philistines will have a champion, and they're asking Israel to have a champion one-on-one. -on -one. You get a picture? It's a boxing match. Whoever wins that one-on-one -on -one match wins the war. So we don't have to kill each other. All of us, right? No damage at all. Just one person. That's it. So it's not a team sport on this occasion. It is a boxing match, a wrestling match, UFC, whatever you want to call it. But that's what it is. One on one. Now here's what happens. Earlier, we are wowed by first impressions, but here's the other thing about appearance. We are worried by first impressions. You see, when you go to verse 4 of chapter 17, it goes like this. And I'm just going to read it from the Living Bible because it's much more descriptive. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was a giant of a man, measuring over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, a 200-pound coat of mail, a breastplate, bronze leggings, carried a bronze javelin several inches thick, tipped the head with a 25-pound iron spearhead, and his armor-bearer walked ahead of him with a huge shield. And he kept on shouting towards the Israelite soldiers, I defy the ranks of Israel. I defy the armies of your God. He kept on taunting the Israelites. Now, when he said, I defy you, that is like the crispest profanity of the day. And if you really want to challenge somebody and get that somebody angry, you curse him. You curse him. You say in the crispest way, the curse. That's what Goliath does. Well, why all these descriptive words about this giant? Did you wonder? Why didn't you just say, oh, Philistine, big man came out. But all these descriptive words about his armor. You see, to me, when the Old Testament narrative tells us a lot, describes a lot about something, there's a point to it. The emphasis. Clearly, the author wants to make a graphic point with all this attention. Before God's people is this monster warrior. Before the people of God is this monster who's a warrior as well. His size, his brutality, his cruelty, that became the North Star of everybody's universe. You know what I'm saying? Everybody centered on this brute of a man and nothing else mattered except this man who crowded out all the space in the minds and hearts of the Israelites. It was all about Goliath. Frightened. You see, when you go to verse 11, here's what happens. When Saul and all Israel heard these words, they were dismayed, greatly afraid. Drop down to verse 24. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him, were greatly afraid. You see, they heard, they saw. He became the center of everything, and they fled. They were greatly afraid. What's the lesson for you and me? You see, our battles 
always loom larger than they really are. Your trials, whatever it is that fixates you and bring to the center of your life, whatever that is, a trial, a burden, a problem, a person, if that person takes on the whole awareness of your life, guess what? They loom larger than they really are. Your trials are not that big, let me say. Even though they're heavy, they are not that powerful. But if you place them in the middle of everything, you will feel like it is everything. You see, appearances intimidate. Appearances overwhelm. But only when we use our natural eyes. A fixation with appearance exaggerates reality and brings it to a point of unreality. I will explain that later on. And the Apostle Paul realizes this. He says, Ephesians 6.12, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not about what you see. Our struggle, our battle is not about what you hear. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. That is where the real battle lies. Not in what you see. Not in what you hear. They all happen in the dark world in the heavenly realms. Well, let's continue on with the story. God wins by the hidden weapon. You know, by this time, you know, David's been moonlighting. Why? Because he's a harpist. Remember, he was brought into the king's court, King Saul, because an evil spirit terrorized him. You know, when, when David was anointed as king, the Holy Spirit came upon David, and an evil spirit came upon Saul. And he would be terrorized by the evil spirit, and he would need somebody to comfort him. And they found David because he was a skillful musician. And David came in, and he played the harp. And whenever he played the harp, King Saul would feel good. And so David was moonlighting. He was both a shepherd and what else? A comforter. He was an entertainer in some sense. But on this day, Jesse the father sends David on a food delivery to the battlefront where they are fighting the Philistines and Goliath. On this day, David is with cheese and bread in order to bring to his three oldest brothers. Again, that again is emphasized. He was bringing the food to the three eldest brothers. If you look at verse 13, it goes like this. And three older sons of Jesse had gone after Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, you gotta say that, as if we didn't know, and the second, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah, and then we look at verse 14, and David was the youngest. There it is again, right? He's a nobody. When you think about the war, he's not even part of the army. He delivers food for his bravest and oldest band of brother warriors. Just need to be reminded again, David, in the eyes of men, is the least of the brave. You can't find the bravest to be the youngest. It's always the firstborn who's enlisted in the army, right? It's always the, the, the firstborn who is the in, inheritor of everything, right? Not the youngest, not the eighth. Maybe the second, but the eighth. Who's going to find the brave eighth son, the youngest? See, that's the mentality. And so as he goes to the front lines where his brothers are fighting the Philistines, David overhears the giant stunting as he delivers the cheese and bread to his brothers. He hears the giant, yet he doesn't quite understand why nobody would dare stand among God's people and volunteer against the monster. Now, why do I say that? He several times he queried the Israelites. He asks one soldier, what will a man get for killing this Philistine? and ending his insults to Israel. 
Who is this heathen that is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Nobody would stand. In fact, over and over again, he would approach one soldier to the next, and he would ask the same question. Who is this heathen that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And nobody would stand. In fact, Eliab, the eldest, the brother, he mocked and accused David of insolence. You know, you left, you left the sheep, you abandoned the sheep in order to be here. And I know why you're here. You're here because you want to be wowed by the spectacle of battle. Isn't that right? You lazy, you insolent, you contemptuous youngest son. Basically, that's my word. Eliab mocked him. You have a wicked heart, David. Can you imagine? Ironic that those closest to David didn't actually know of his bravery. And those afar knew that he was a mighty man of valor, that he was a warrior. Why? You look at chapter 16, previously, verse 18. That's why he was chosen to be Saul's comforter. Not only was he a skillful musician, he was a man of valor and a warrior. And so others knew about his bravery, but those closest to him did not. That's ironic, isn't it? And so with this, David says, it's probably fed up, verse 32. Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Verse 33. Saul actually speaks to David. And he says this. You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a youth. While he has been a warrior from his youth. You stand no chance against this giant. You know. Always underestimated, always underrated, simply due to his appearance, the youngest, tending the sheep. But you see, he had a defense, and he says this in verse 36. To his defense, he says, Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Why? Because he has taunted the armies of the living God. The Lord will deliver me to me, this man, as he delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Those are incredible words, isn't it? Everyone's defying the armies of the living God. And no one would stand to it when God is attacked. And David said, I am convinced if there's nobody, any attack on my God is personal. And he stood up. And so convinced Saul prepared David pound for pound. Saul was convinced, okay, this guy is the sure thing. And so what does Saul do? He says, fighting Goliath on Goliath's terms. How's that? He placed a bronze helmet on David. A breastplate for David. A sword for David. He tried them on and he couldn't move an inch. And he unclothed, disrobed, and he said, no, 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 that's not for me. You see, that is fighting in Goliath's terms. You know what I'm saying? I don't fight like that. My fight, my struggle is different. So what does he do? You see, he took them all off because all of that made Goliath already an XL, a triple XL in his sight when he put on those armor if he fought on Goliath's terms. But you see, he knew how to fight in God's terms. And that is where we all need to be. Look at verse 40. What does he do? He took his stick, chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. Now you wonder, 
Why five and why smooth? Well, I'll tell you why when you join me in May, when we go down to the brook itself and we'll pick up some smooth stones and we'll try to sling it and try to hit a target. It is smooth because it is more accurate than a non-smooth stone. He knew what he was doing. Why is it five? That I don't know. Maybe because only five would fit his small bag. He came prepared. I mean, he had a bag. I mean, he did not presume on God by saying, I only need one. He packed it all in. Five of them. But they were smooth stones. You see, that's what he did. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the giant. Verse 45. You come to me, Goliath, with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. That's your terms. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I come to you not fighting your battle on your terms. I'm going to fight you, God's battle, on his terms. Verse 46 goes like this. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down, remove your head from you, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. In verse 47, it goes like this. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's. You know what I'm saying? That's a totally different perspective when he fights battles. The battle was real. Goliath was real. I mean, all the armaments and weapons, armors, they were all real. He was really nine feet tall. And David was four foot five. No, I'm not sure. These were all real. But you see, Goliath did not take center stage as far as David is concerned. The center is still God himself. You see, that battle flipped from David versus Goliath to God versus the dog. You know what Goliath said when he saw David? He said, oh, he's a handsome guy. And then he says, am I a dog? That you come to me with sticks? Am I a dog? You know, that's how things flip. You see, in God's eyes, Goliath was a dog. And so in a way, the battle tipped and it became a different kind of a battle. It was God against the dog. And when that happens, God always wins. God always wins the battle. So here's a question for us this morning. What was in the heart of this young shepherd boy? That he was the solitary figure that had the nerve to fight the Herculean giant. What was in the heart of this young boy? And I think there might be three essential hidden qualities. The first is this. David had a grace seasoned compassion grace seasoned compassion and he learned that from a lifetime with being with the lambs and the sheep that's why he's able to write Psalm 23 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he leadeth me to green pastures he restores my soul you see he understands what a shepherd is like because for a lifetime, he's been taking care of lamb and sheep. It's probably what made him a great comforter to Saul. That's why he was chosen. A humble servant to his elder brothers. He did deliveries of food. That's the first thing. The second thing we see in his heart is this. He had a gut-steeled courage. Gut. Hard gut. Why? He fought the lions. You know, he might have learned compassion with the lambs. But he also learned courage with the lions and the bears. In other words, in his lifetime, in his journey as a boy, as a shepherd, he was already learning. God was already training him in the sovereign foundations of his life. 
even though he was not necessarily perfectly aware that God was in his midst, God was already preparing this guy in obscurity, insignificant, and yet he was learning essential character qualities that made him the right choice for God. God still, can you imagine? Whenever a lion and a bear would pounce on the lamb, you know what he would do? He would follow that bear or lion. And he would grab the head and he would strike it and kill it with his bare hands. Think about that. I don't know how you learn that except by doing it, isn't it? You learn courage by doing it. That's how you learn it. And so he had that in his heart. Then finally, he developed what I would call a God-saturated consciousness. You see, nothing can remove God in the center of his awareness. No trial, no person, no burden could remove God from that center. He's saturated with the presence of God. You see, in the hills of Bethlehem, perhaps, the rugged terrain of the Judean desert. I presume David was so enthralled with how big and how near God was. You know what I'm saying? You know, when, when, when I, I like nature a lot. In fact, that's how I recuperate when I am tired and exhausted. I go to a, a place where there's just expanse. And that is where I find that God is so big and that God is so near. And that, I think, is what's going on with David. God's word, which he couldn't literally hear, was more real to David than the lion's roar, which he could hear. Do you get that one? The word of God, which he couldn't literally hear, was louder than the roar of the lion in his life. He had worshipped the majesty of God so constantly that God's love, which he couldn't see, was far more real to him than the ferocity of the bear. God's love was far more real than anything else in his life. Can you imagine? What kind of a guy is this? But he learned that, all of that, in the field of obscurity and insignificance. As I said earlier to David, the attack in the front of Goliath really was against his God and to him that was so personal. John Piper may have expressed the disgust well. He says something like this. And you can feel probably what David felt at that moment before standing in the gap. Piper says something like this. This is the ultimate outrage. The glory of God is not honored the holiness of God not reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not treasured, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the commandments of God not obeyed, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved, the infinite all-glorious creator of the universe by whom and for whom all things exist who holds every person's life and being at every moment this God is disregarded this God is disbelieved this God is disobeyed dishonored among the peoples of the world and somebody stands in the gap David did you see, when everyone else was using their natural eyes to wage war, David's eyes were trained on the real North Star, God himself. You see, God was the reality with which David had to do. Let me repeat that. God was the reality with which David had to do. Giants, no matter what color, no matter what size, no matter what shape, no matter how large, 
giants didn't figure largely in David's understanding of the real world. Giants don't figure large in the real world. You see, when our reality pushes God off center, our reality without God in the center turns to an unreality. The trials get darker. The burdens get heavier. We persevere through it all. But after a while of being under its weight, we begin to succumb to its crippling power. Our mood swings. Our perspectives change. Our joy lost. And our hearts give in. And then we begin to live from one fix to another. Because our hopes are smothered and we want out. Brothers and sisters, friends, that's unreality. Because the real thing is God. When He's at the center of all things, that changes everything. If He's in the center, you'll be able to live in that reality no matter how heavy it gets, no matter how dark it may be. You see, God doesn't intend our lives to be so dark. Our trials are real, no doubt about that. Our burdens are heavy, no doubt about that. However, what we think of reality is oftentimes not real because God is not there. The real reality is God. His sovereign power over every creature his sovereign power over every chance. What he says is real. That's the true reality of our lives. And therefore, bring him always and then always to the center. Turn your eyes on Jesus and don't lose that gaze on him. Never lose that gaze on him. And so let me end with this. We just need to frame our world the way David did. We need to be Davidic in our lives. And so the questions are these, simple. Are we going to live by our admiration of Saul or by our fascination with God? Are we going to live this life from our knees, picking up God's stones, not man's spears? Are we going to be shaped by our fears of Goliath or by faith in God? You see, let not appearance wow you. Let not appearance worry you. Work on that hidden person of the heart. Work on that hidden weapon of faith. Amen?